were very lucky to be right smack in the middle of their unceded territory. I was born here, but I don't have family in the Simnus Band. I'm a family background is from Great Britain, but we're grateful and acknowledge their, uh, their hosting of us in this beautiful part of the world. If you'd like to go on our website, there's really detailed directions on how to get here. We're pretty close to both BC ferry terminals in Nanaimo, roughly half hour from each one, 12 minutes from the Nanaimo airport. Uh, there's float planes, Harbor Air, there's many ways to get here. Our shuttle van is not running because of COVID right now. We don't have drivers and it's one of those things, but um, the directions are there on the site. And if you're arriving by mail, it's 3700 Yellow Point Road. There we go. Is my starting the place very early on uh, with the little tiny cabins and the original lodge, which was a small cabin. That was a cookhouse and a dining room and seven little tiny cabins, very much like fruit stands, which is a nickname we have for them today. At the north end of the property, his plan always was to build a nice, big, impressive place on the point in the sun, which he opened in 1939, uh, ran as a pretty popular place all through those years till 1985, when it, the old one, what we call the old lodge, which is listed here as the new lodge, burned to the ground. Uh, we didn't know what else to do, so we built another one and have been carrying on ever since. Now. I'd just like to sidetrack a little bit and say, uh, my dad was born in 1893. He served in World War I, and he was a prisoner of war in Aachen and Riga and on the Russian front. And he had seen the property in this state as a 10-year-old boy. His, his, his dad's brother, Claude, had a place which is now known as Two Coves, and dad and his family lived in Burnaby. Dad would come over and visit Uncle Claude and he'd crew on his boat and they'd cruise the waters and they'd go sailing. And he spotted this piece of land and he was taken by the, the, the white shell beaches and the Southern exposure that got all the sun. And the fact that most of the waterfront in this area, there's a bit of a bluff. You're down on the beach and then you gotta climb up the bluff and then you're on the land. But here the land would slope gently down. You could walk to the beach and it was just great stuck in his mind as a kid. So when he enlisted for World War I at the 29th Battalion and was in France on the front lines and was captured and spent three years in German prisoner war camps, what he did was he kept imagining what he was gonna do when he got home. He said, when I get home, I'm gonna buy that piece of property and I'm gonna build this big lodge right on that point. And we're gonna have the living room on the top and then the other part can go down below the point and then we'll have the big pool around the front and guests will come in, they'll all eat and da, da, da. When I get home, I'm gonna do this. When I get home, I'm gonna do that. And he always had one foot back home and he credited that with uh, helping him keep his state of mind and, and not fall into despair like many of his, his co-prisoners, his fellow prisoners did. So having seen it ahead of time, having a vision for what he wanted to do when he got home was key for him. And uh, this was the state it was in when he got back home and finally was able to put, um, sign the papers and buy the property, the first original 90 acres in 1929. There's your cue. Thanks, Q. So he moved down to the north end of the property because he didn't want to use all the best spots right away. So he built what the house I grew up in and what was the original cookhouse and dining room in the darkest, shadiest, most tucked away spot on the whole place. It gets direct sunlight on June 21st from about 7.15 in the evening till about eight, um, and that's it. But what he did was built that place as a cookhouse dining room. And then in the background of the picture, you can see those little, they look like fruit stands. They look like you're in the Okanagan buying peaches. And what they were, were the little beach cabins. So the guests would come and stay. And they'd stay in these tiny little shacks that didn't have plumbing and just had a little tiny wood stove. And then he'd ring a bell and everybody would come into the little cabin and they'd be food and they'd have their meal together. And then they'd go out and frolic on the beach or whatever it was and everything was great. And that was the original Yellow Point Lodge from about 1935 until 1939 when he'd actually finished this project that he'd started. No, that's right. That's him there back in the day, very young. 
little pet deer, obviously friendly with nature and appreciated the natural things. That's him down at the other end of the property. In the background of that picture now is what would be present day uh, in of the sea or um, uh, Roberts, no, sorry, uh, Blue Heron Park. So that's the very north end of the property. So at this time, he was busy working six days a week. So I always took a day off, six days a week, building what became the first lodge on the site where we are now. Now, of course, you're gonna build a log lodge, you're gonna need some logs. And he was an old logger. And one of the jobs he'd done uh, back in the day between getting home from the war and buying the property was a hand logger, a Jippo contractor, uh, any kind of job he could take. He was a self-taught blaster. He was a real hands-on, if you can write it down, you can tell me what to do, I can do it. So this picture is taken up in the hills behind Ladysmith where they logged all these nice uniform logs that would make a great log building, hauled them down to Ladysmith Harbor in behind, um, in the harbor there, towed them around to Yellow Point, moored them up not far from into the sea now, uh, hauled them up a skid road. You can still, there's a tree on the property to this day. You can still see the ladder rungs they nailed in so we could have the big pulley and cable to pull these logs up. As he got to work building, on the site now of the original lodge. That is the concrete framing for the basement. And he'd have to have that all set. There's some of the logs being taken into place. That truck, by the way, also he'd, uh, he'd take it over to, if any of you know the place where the tree shower is now, jack it up, take a wheel off, throw a belt around the drum, and then the truck would be used to drive the sawmill that he had set up where the tree shower is now. So everything very hands-on, very, uh, well, as you can see, very rustic. And he finished the original lodge and opened it on the site we're at now, this one, in 1939. I'll show you this in detail later. I know it's a very small picture. This is his double-bitted ax that he actually used to build the original lodge because each one of these logs you can see nestled together has to have a very precise what's called a saddle cut so the other log will fit right in no chainsaws no scribes in those days everything done by hand by axe he was uh he was a humble guy i mean he was very self-depreciating and he'd make jokes about himself but he was justifiably proud of his axe work which was pretty much top of the game at that point so there's the original lodge that's the office in fact, Hugh, can you go back one on that? If you go to the lodge today and you're just walking up to the front entrance, the left space is the window of the office and the tree is the great big oak tree that's still there to this day. So carry on. And there he was, finished. This picture is a little tiny bit out of sequence because you can see the very top floor on the right. That's the the penthouse, his apartment he added on in the 50s. And you can already see that below that, the uh, deck outside the dining room has been glassed in and enclosed. Uh, so this is a lot in the early days, but not the very, very first days. Prominent in the picture, of course, is the arbutus trees, the two trees growing through the roof that he just did not have the heart to cut down. He spent so much time trying to get the building to fit and save the little tree at the end of the lounge, as you can see, and nestle everything in. And he'd look at these two arbutus trees and they just wouldn't fit. They used to use the phrase that poor little bums, he said they spent all these winters clinging to the side of the rock and there's nice trees and who might have come along and cut them down. So he built the building around them and they stayed there for years and years. They bloomed inside. They lived for years and years after that. And uh, says a lot about the kind of guy he was and his relationship with nature and how he felt we should interact with it. That's the original lodge. That does have the penthouse you can see starting on the top floor. But uh, also you can see his thanks cute, his experiment with the 48 inch shakes. He didn't want to spend all his time putting shakes on the roof. So he hand split a whole raft of four foot long shakes out of gorgeous cedar that for some reason didn't seem to last too long but uh anyway that is the original building that picture will be 53 54 
And if you subtract that little room on the top floor, there's a picture coming up without it. That is the lodge, Yellow Point Lodge that started there in 1939 and stood there pretty much exactly the same until uh, October 85. Another shot of the main living room with the tree growing through the roof, the two trees. Interesting to note is this sandstone beneath um, is still there to this day. When the lodge burned down, we had to reinforce behind that wall for the posts for the new building, but we were able to keep all of his original stonework, which was the first work he ever did on that building, was drilling holes in the sandstone and setting that, that stonework in place. And that's still there to this day. That's a view from the end of the lounge. Looking down, now you can see the seven little fruit stands, or three of them anyway, that were the original cabins at the north end of the property, floated around on little floats and towed into their present locations where they sit to this very day. And you can in fact rent them out for about another week and a half till they close for the season. Unbeatable value. That, as I mentioned to Marina earlier, taken from one of the new fangled inventions called the airplane is the original lodge. Now that's an early picture because it does not have the retaining wall at the end of the lounge on the right cue. Right there, there's a retaining wall, little patio there. It doesn't have the penthouse, which you were pointing out earlier on the top floor. That's what it was originally. And it does not have the swimming pool which is a prominent feature that was added in 1953, based on his experience working as a contractor for the BC Electric Company, which is now called BC Hydro. He used to get contracts. Hydro would come to him and say, well, we're gonna build this big dam and we need this river out of the way while we build the dam. So we want you to build a little dam to move the river to the side. We'll build the big dam and then we're gonna come along and blow up yours and destroy it. So, okay, he built what was called diversion dams and did a good job of it. And in fact, he did the facing on the Alouette Lake Dam, which you can see to this day up in the north arm of the Fra up north of the Fraser. But he said, you know, one day I'm gonna build one where they're not gonna come along and blow it up. And that's the swimming pool that sits there to this day as well. Lots of driftwood, even back then. That's another picture of the original lodge very early on without any of the additional stuff. And um, like I say, this is before drones and all that kind of stuff. So I know the exact tree the person had to climb way up to take this picture. And it's, of course, is still there too. These are photos of a series of postcards that were taken from drawings and watercolor paintings by the, at the time, very famous artist, Edward Goodall. Now, Edward Goodall is pictured on the top left beside the cutter, he did a series of pretty much all the famous buildings in BC of the day, the Parliament buildings, the Sylvia Hotel, the Hotel Vancouver, even the Crystal Court Motel at the foot of Douglas, all kinds of landmarks of BC were immortalized by Edward Goodall. There he is sitting on the dock doing a picture of the lodge. I'll show you this later when you got a big picture of me, but he's actually painting this picture. That was a popular postcard back in the day. So as you can see, there's the beach cabins, the original lodge. Those were in the early 50s, those pictures taken. And that copper pot, sorry Q, on the left of the fireplace is the only thing that survives the fire in 85. And if you come by today for dinner or to stay for a week or two, uh, you'll still see that copper pot in that exact same spot beside the fireplace. This is the picture of the main living room and we have the old piano and different but similar to what we have today. Now we have more couches because there's more people, but the floor, the fireplace, the shelving, the wood room center right has a door now and the bookshelf is on the other side of the room, but that's what it was built for back in the day and that's what it's used for today. The uh, floor you see is 1800 square feet and it's actually built on coil springs from railway cars. Back in the day, dancing and ballroom was a big deal. So he wanted all the fun stuff he could have for his lodge. So he built that floor 
on coil springs. <clears throat> so of course, when the lodge burned down, people would ask us, oh, okay, sure, the kid took over, the lodge burned down. Is it gonna be the same? Are you gonna have the same big fireplace? And we'd say, yes. And they'd say, well, are you gonna have the same springy dance floor? And we'd say, well, yes, we are. And people like, oh, oh okay, it might not be bad then, but that was the inspiration. The room is very similar to what it is today. Many a party had in that room, as you can see. That is, uh, yeah, as the caption says, a pretty wild getaway in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, back in the day, it would be like, well, all, uh, all the girls, well, they're going to get together, and the girls are going to go away and have a little weekend together, a little girls weekend away together. And the fellas, well, you know, we're getting together with the fellas, and we're going to go away, and we're going to go to the island, we're going to have a little fellas get away together, and they forget to tell their parents that they were all going to the same place, which was this raucous lodge outside of Ladysmith called Yellow Point Lodge. And uh, there they are, looking pretty young. I would say there may be some of the same people in that picture still coming today, but uh, a little more seasoned. Again, another shot. Now, if you took the first picture and you just turned around, this would be the view for the other one. There's a great view of the two big arbutus trees going right through the roof. There's an awesome view of the saggy couches <laughs> that we could get a hold of at the time. Uh, an ashtray, you don't see those anymore. And that's people uh, having tea, hanging out, relaxing. That picture actually is available and is on record at the BC archives in Victoria. And it's uh, you can see leaves on the trees. It was blooming inside and pole lamps, the logs and People hanging out in the big room and uh, having a good time, not uh, telling their parents where they were going. Another shot in the same area. Looks like the 40s. Somebody might know better if that's early 50s or what have you, but uh, just a lot of young people out at the lodge having fun. And uh, they did that for a whole lot of years, except for the lady on the right. Looked like she's uh, maybe not too happy about having her picture taken but it could have been just who took the picture. You never know. Out front, right at the front of the lodge, looking down, uh, I don't know if that's somebody windsurfing. No, it isn't. But uh, before the pool was built, so pre-1953, the hills behind Ladysmith in the background, Mount Hall, uh, Mount Breton kind of thing. That's just uh, life at the lodge in the early 50s. That photo, the lady on the left is Bunty Ellis. She was Bunty Beard at the time. She came over and worked at the lodge, lived in Vancouver, worked at the lodge in 1941, and went, <clears throat> went back home to Vancouver and said to her friend, uh, Betty Elizabeth Will, hey, you should come over to this lodge and get a job in the summer. It's really fun. So the lady on the right came over in 1942, ended up marrying my dad, and that's my mom. So that's a great picture of my mom uh, having a good time. They're both having fun. They both look like they're getting up to a little mischief, and I don't doubt it one bit. Dad was a veteran in World War I. Uh, he always had a soft spot in his heart for service people. During World War II, the lodge was a great spot for servicemen to come and relax, have a few days off, and uh, he always made sure he looked after the, the men and women who served the country. And uh, here they are on leave, hanging out with the uh, having some fun and uh, you know, maybe coming to a dance at the lodge that they had on Saturday night like we still do to this day. That's just a historical picture, same big shakes, <clears throat> same chairs and love seats we have to this day. That's before the, the penthouse was built. I'm trying to see if I can recognize anybody, but no, but you know, a lot of young folks coming to the resort and getting their picture taken, which was a big deal in those days. This was taken before automobiles were invented. Um, okay, I'm kidding. But back in the day, there was a lot of, we still have bikes and kayaks and tennis and all this kind of stuff. But back in the day, actually, they had horse riding and stables and dad had some of the staff girls would come over from university and look after the horses. Got to be a bit onerous. Uh, guests often didn't know really how to treat horses. Got expensive. And if you're gonna have a horse, you have to really look after it. If you're going to have a riding stable, it has to be your main thing. So the uh, horse riding went away in 1960. So this picture is taken before 1960, which means it's before I was born. 
There's the pool. The top one, a bit grainy, but that was the day, is the pool being built in 1953, 52 and 53, by my dad and 11 women. And he used to kid around in later days and try to get people riled up by calling himself the father of women's lib. But sure enough, he set the tone and he had the skills and he had the background. And women like Bunchy Ellis, who you saw earlier, and her sister Barb, and my mom, and lots of women worked on pouring the concrete. And he thought he invented what's called the slip form, which is that frame you see on the pool <clears throat> where they build to it. And then when the concrete set, they'd slide the form along and build to that, slide it along, slide it along. I'm not sure, but there's the pool being built in 53. And there it is finished back when we were allowed to have a diving board and also back when we were allowed to climb out of the pool. And if you see that little dark canister on the deck, that's when you're allowed to climb out of the pool and grab onto a five horse, 220 volt electric motor while you were soaking in salt water. Um, not up to code these days, but we didn't get into any trouble until we changed it out. So that's uh, progress for you. That's even before the handrail was up. And uh, they had a bit of fun back in the day. That's dad, apparently some event going on. I don't know if that's a pumpkin, a jack-o'-lantern to the lower right. <clears throat> that would explain that this might be around Halloween. But they had a lot of fun in the old days and they goofed around a lot. And why not, not hurting anybody. Uh, regular guests will know that's the view right at the front of the lodge, looking through the office windows. There's the old oak tree that's still there. And I wish I had the car in the background, but there he is in a little more serious mode, probably telling stories, many, many stories, the skull in the fireplace, the maybe time in the war, who knows. But uh, I think somebody said, Jerry, I want to get a picture of you. Let's get a picture of you standing inside the fireplace. He was proud of the fireplace that he almost killed the truck building with that great big mantelpiece on the top. But he always thought, you know, we have a big room like that. And if you had a little normal sized fireplace, it would just look like a silly little thing you wouldn't even see. So he wanted the fireplace to look like Stonehenge and really be impressive. <clears throat> and I tell you, it's, it's very impressive until you have to go and collect wood for it. Then it seems way too big. But anyway, it's still in play till this day. There they are, I think, making, I don't know if that's eggnog or some holiday feast. That's my father in his later years. He could have easily been well into his late 70s by that point. He stayed young for a very long time in the original lodge with his youngest son from his first marriage, Jerry, and then his daughter-in-law of his first son from his first marriage, that's Beth. So Dave's wife, Beth, and dad's son, Jerry. And then uh, he got married again years later and had me. But that's them in the kitchen working on the great big marble slab that came from the old Hotel Vancouver that came down in 1939, replaced by the new Hotel Vancouver, which is the one you know today on, I think it's Hornby in Georgia or Burrard in Georgia. There is the fabulous cutter that he was down in Victoria at the Victoria Machinery Depot buying furniture like armoires and footstools and chest of drawers off the old Empress of China, Empress of Japan, the old CPR boats they were taking down. And he said to the man there, <clears throat> you know, if you ever have an old, an open boat or a good, you know, day boat I could use for taking guests on picnics and stuff, let me know. And the guy said, well, get a load of this. And he took him around the corner, lifted up the tarp. There was the, what we call the cutter, a uh, World War II lifeboat from the HMCS Ontario, 32 feet long, just taken off the boat as she's being recommissioned for a training vessel, brand spanking new, $3,000, a lot of money in those days, but a lot less than the 20 grand it costs the Navy to have built. There's the cutter in the 50s, I guess, judging by the hairdos, maybe. And uh, if it wasn't for COVID, we would have been taking her out this year because the boat is still in very, very good shape. Anybody who knows the Ladysmith Maritime Society might know Robert Lawson, and he's done a lot of work with me 
uh, bringing that boat back up to almost better than new condition. And she's in fine shape today, sitting in the shed, waiting for this spring when we can maybe get her back in the water. That's not the cutter, but that's the newfangled sport of water skiing. Uh, the pool is there, the penthouse is there. So this would be mid late fifties. The old dock, which looks like a Gilligan's Island raft is there. And that's just part of the loads of fun you had in the afternoon when you're here, staying at Yellow Point Lodge with all your friends. Now you have to take a kayak out. There's dad probably in his late seventies before we got the cutter fixed up with his friend Ian Sherwin. You can see the barbecue and the picnic area in the background. It's obviously summer, it's the grass is all yellow. And they're heading out in the cutter and uh, doesn't look like it's full of guests. So who knows what kind of nonsense is gonna go on at that point, but uh, he seems happy. And there we go. A little background to this was uh, 19, uh, summer of 85, right after we tripled the fire insurance, set up a separate workshop and got all the tools out of the basement, set up a sawmill, removed the tar paper carport that would have spread a fire. And the accountant had come to dad and I and said, you know, Jerry, you're 92 and Richard's 25. And if you pass away with the lodge in your name, the capital gains tax is gonna only be paid by him selling the property. That's the only way you're coming up with that much money. So if you guys want this thing to go on, you should probably sell it to the boy for cheap pretty soon. So I he looked at me and I looked at him and I, he, he wanted it to go on. I wanted it to go on. So he sold it to me for very, very cheap in July of 1985. I thought everything was great and everything's just looking good. And this is great. And then three months later, this happened. And go ahead, Q and it burned out. So there's a bit of captioning there if you wanna read it, but basically the, uh, the story was dad and I stood down on the pool patio watching the last of it go because the comedy of errors ensured that it was not gonna be able to be put out with everything from the phone lines being shorted out to the problem with the fire being the uh, water heater that emptied the propane tank into the building capped off with the fire department showing up and having all their gas powered pumps actually filled by accident with diesel oil so they wouldn't start. So that lodge is burning down. So we're watching the last thing go and he kind of looks at me and says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, well, pretty much like the caption says, well, we don't really know how to do anything else. So we should probably build another one and try and run a lodge. And we took three looks at it and said, well, we can uh, get the bit of insurance money and, uh, you know, or we do nothing and we can go down or we can get the insurance money and we can build something kind of okay, but you can't do much with that much money because you can only insure to the old lodge and we could maybe do okay, or we could maybe go down or we get the insurance money and we can go to the bank and we can borrow some money and we'd build the lodge up really nice and we could build new cabins and we could upgrade things and we could take a really good shot at it and we could either do great or we could do okay or we could go down. So we thought, well, since we're going down anyway, we might as well go down in flames. So we went to the bank. Uh, he had a friend helping manage and operate the place, a fellow named Ron Friend, who really was responsible for setting the tone for the lodge as we know it today. He steered the clientele away from the hard drinking, long weekend crowds, and he established the uh, more relaxed, getaway, communist nature, sort of modern feel for the lodge that we know now. Uh, Ron was instrumental in organizing the rebuilding effort, uh, a lot of people involved, but got to give some credit to Ron Friend while we're talking about getting on track and getting the lodge rebuilt. It wasn't just Dad and I saying, let's do it. There was a lot of people involved who were very talented, but there's the wreckage we're left with. After we cleaned up the mess, that's all that was left was the fireplace. The people in the picture are guests who all volunteered to come over and help. They'd come over mostly from Vancouver. We'd put them up for the weekend. They'd work hard in the rain, in the cold, 
sorting through ash, lifting logs, just terrible work, nasty work. Clean the place up. Then when we started rebuilding, they peel the logs by hand. They put every lick of paint on the whole place inside and out. It was called the Friends of Yellow Point Society, composed of loyal, long-term guests, wonderful people. That society ran for many, many years. They still uh, administer scholarship fund for our staff to this day. So anyway, that's all we had left. So time to build a new one. So what do we do now? Well, that fell in the picture. His name is Ray Green. He was Ron's daughter's boyfriend. He's from California. He's 23 in that picture. I was 25, he's 23. Extremely accomplished, very confident, uh, take on any challenge. He was really key. He was the site foreman of the rebuild. I was the crane operator. Ron was the, the organizer and the manager of the project. A fellow named Bill Phillips acquired all the materials. Then we had a crew of guys like Don Dow and Gary Durbin and Dave Friend and, and a few other people. But uh, Ray Green, instrumental. If it wasn't for him, we, uh, the lodge would not have been built back as fast and as well as it was, period. I spoke to him on the phone the other day. We remain friends to this day. We went through a real experience rebuilding the place and uh, that guy gets a lot of credit. There we are, back in business, starting to frame. Uh, guests will know that's the rumpus room. Those are the two posts that are coated and covered in stone in the rumpus room. And then right underneath the two big posts in the dining room, there's the shop in the background. You can see the parsonage. You could see the kayak shed. And that's us getting busy framing pouring concrete, getting ready to bring all the, well, there's pull the forms off. There's the concrete. Here's Ron's son, Dave Friend, lives in Victoria, shimming up a spot for one of the big posts to sit on top of. That's the rumpus room. There's the beams going into place. That's the rumpus room ceiling. It's the dining room floor. And that great big beam is very visible. There's the floor all done. The logs are all peeled by the Friends of Yellow Point pulling them down on the deck, having a look and getting ready on the weekend to start putting the logs back up. That's the very end of the lounge. That's the first log frame that went up with our 1948 link belt speeder that we bought for four grand from uh, Tom Thorpe Double and Shimanus. Found out later that Crane Boom had an extra 12 feet welded into it for his small log home. So the thing was just as tippy as you can imagine. And I did teach myself how to run the thing. And I ran that until it got too small, uh, actually until workers' compensation came and shut it down because the boom was starting to collapse. But that thing did a lot of work. There's the lounge, there's the logs, there's the temporary floor. Each one of the stripes on those logs is a blade mark done by hand from either one of the friends of Yellow Point or myself in uh, February, March, cold, not pleasant work, but show must go on. Starting to shape up, roughly the same era. You can see the crane boom in the background, the rumpus room windows, the flooring, more of the lounge going into play. You can see in the logs, the one right in the middle, it's got a square hole. It's got a saddle cut into the left-hand side. It's got a flat spot along the edge. It's got a channel cut in the flat spot for a plywood spline. A whole lot of work and thought had to go into these things before they went up into place. There's Ray. And when I look at that picture, I can see the wheels turning in his head. We've been taught by a guy named Miles Porter and a well-known log builder how to do that kind of uh, post and beam, mortise and tenon. Ray is now looking at it, figuring out how to get it completely square so we can scribe a line from the bottom log to the top log so we can cut the curve and make them fit just perfectly. Uh, that guy's talent can't be understated. There they are coming together. That's uh, various logs in the, on the right, there's the lobby in room five. In the middle is the top floor. Uh, the left is the off uh, the lobby. Uh, just a whole bunch of logs going to look like a lodge one day if we keep at it, which we did. The fireplace, the old crane still doing its job, the rafters, the roofing starting up. This would be um, spring of 1986 as we are 
working hard to have that main room finished by the May long weekend so we could have temporary kitchen and dining room and <clears throat> our cabins that were detached from the lodge open a separate office and have our guests actually in the living room sitting in front of the fire by the May long weekend, not even a year after the fire. But quite a bit to do, like build the giant fireplace. That's the big slab of sandstone we got off the beach, ho hoisted it up there with a chain block, like for hauling car motors, and then braced in place with all those uh, planks while the mortar set, part of uh, building a lodge. A little more of the same era. In the background, you can see the crane boom of our new crane after Compo shut us down, which was called in the old days. We were able to rent <coughs> a proper crane from a guy named Lou Sear. He came down, <coughs> he was one of these fellas, pardon me. He uh, kind of, you know, big round face. And when he smiled, he would squint and he couldn't see his eyes. So we said, Lou, we need a crane. Everybody else we talked to says it's hundred bucks an hour and it comes with an operator, but it sits idle for many hours at a time while we're doing the log work. We can't pay a guy 400 bucks to sit there and do nothing. We need a crane with no operator. I did it up till now. So he looked at Ray and I, who were a couple of long haired kids in their twenties. And he looked at the old crane we had, the old beater. Then he looked at the lodge that we got built up to that point. And he looked back at us, he looked at the crane, he looked at the lodge, he looked at it, he did that three times. We can't see his eyes the whole time. And he finally says, okay, hundred bucks a day, don't tip it over. And that was how we were really able to make it on budget, roughly speaking with, I think there's a picture of the crane coming up, which was, nope, there's the work it did. Those, uh, as you can see, those log posts go up all three floors. You can see the guys in the dining room, raised in the lodge rooms, the guest rooms, another floor on top. So those posts are like 30 feet straight up and had to be set in place. Some of them from the beach. So I had to drive the crane down on the beach to set them up. And then we had to put the beams across the top. Then I had to put Ray in a bosun's chair, which is a thing that looks like a swing from a playground on the crane. And I'd hoist him up in the crane, set him on top of the logs with a great big drill that you'd have to hold onto like a motorcycle. And then he'd drill down into the logs and drive these big rebar pins in to hold the thing in place. Probably not recommended today. And I hope there's nobody from WorkSafe BC listening to that part, but it was a long time ago and everybody was fine. So anyway, next slide, Q, probably should uh, move on. <laughs> Guests will notice that's the dining room shaping up. We took a lot of pictures as things started to become recognizable. That's from the back, looking at the back of the kitchen where the big roof line is now. You can see scaffolding all over the place, the interior framing, lodge is starting to shape up. There's the crane on the right that Lou ended up giving us. I think we have a better shot coming up. That's the old crane, a little out of sequence picture. That's okay, black and white before color photography. There's the lodge shaping up again, a mess like any construction site. There's the front entrance but now we could recognize it. So it's like, oh, take a picture. That looks like the lodge, take a picture. So lots of those. There's the crane, beautiful grove. We got 20 ton. I actually had a lot of fun playing with that. It was, that was fun. Just, you just get good at it for the end of the job when they take it away. Now we're really taking pictures because the lodge is looking like the lodge. You can still see scaffolding. You can still see a bit of work needs to be done, but this is gonna be, uh, late summer of 1986, there were guests hanging out in the lounge. There were people staying here in the temporary kitchen and dining room and the cabins. We were thinking we were probably going to pull this off at this point. Until we started walking around upstairs and found that the plywood floor on the top floor rang like a drum. If we were down in the guest rooms and someone was walking around upstairs, it sounded like a timpani. And we figured it is just not going to work. A plywood floor, way too loud. We had some balconies planned for upstairs. The engineers said we have to get rid of the balconies because the only way we're going to solve the problem is to pour concrete all over the carpet and lino that we already have in place. So this is one of those oops things that comes up in the middle of a job. We've had to staple poly all over the carpet. That's a plastic sheet all over the carpet and lino and pull the toilets and then run the concrete pump up through the third floor windows 
and slop concrete all over the floor to build up two inches of concrete for soundproofing. And that's me looking quite surprised at the extra money we're spending. Um, I was about 26 at that point, but hey, look at that, it worked out. So concrete floors, top and bottom, nice and soundproof. You don't hear people marching around. Any job, as you know, at home will have one of those things that happens. So that's the temporary kitchen dining room. We got the tent from Expo. We had an Atco trailer from a logging camp that had all the kitchen gear in it, which we used in the first lodge, moved it down. Uh, and then we built a little deck and a little plywood thing around it. But instead of a tent, we thought it sounded better if we called it the pavilion. So that was the dining pavilion for the spring and summer of 1986. We actually had to have Thanksgiving dinner in there in 86 in October and uh, it worked out okay. And I think that might even be me in the picture in the blue shirt. I, I don't know what I'm doing sitting. Oh, yeah, because there's Dave, there's JP Benoit, and there's John McKinley, and there's, yeah, that's it. So it must be a break in the action. That is a current picture because the original back staircase uh, was all wood and just didn't stand the test of time. So there's the new staircase out back. There's the new siding and the new windows that were put in by local guy, Lance Goldie, who is another amazingly talented character I get to work with. I said to him, he pointed out to me and we said, what do we do? And finally said, well, we have to remove the entire south face of the building, lounge and main section. We have to coat the logs in copper sheeting. We have to replace the dining room windows, the lower windows, the guest room windows, all the siding and rain screen while we're open and uh, good old Lance Goldie took that job and went off basically without a hitch. So that guy is another talented cat who gets a ton of credit too. That's during the earthquake, no. Okay, there we are this day. I picked this picture because everybody looks good except for me. Uh, carrying on is, uh, well, me in the center. To the right in the photo to my left is my wife, Sandy, who I've known since a teenager, born in Ladysmith. On my right, on the left of the picture is our daughter, Marley. Beside her is our son, Luke. Above me is Marley's husband, Corey. Their little daughter, Andy, who's now two, it's a fairly old picture, and they have another one on the way. Plan is for her to step in and start giving us a little time off and we'll see what happens. Luke just got his welding ticket. So basically, I suppose the expression is me thinking about the future, but... Uh, there we are, family business. It'll be 82 years this December as the official opening date for the lodge on the site we're on now was when my sister, my half sister, dear sister departed, Leslie, uh, lit the first fire in the fireplace Christmas Eve, 1939. One of our two new cabins is named after her. So that last slide, Hugh, oh no, hang on, there's a panorama. So that's why you want to come here. You can stay in the nice lodge. You can swim in the nice pool. You can hang out on the patio and then you can go down on the dock and get in a boat and see what a great place you live. Here we are today. Ring a bell. Everybody comes in, sits down for meals. Now we're just getting back to that. It's covid -y. This is pre-COVID. We're going to get back to the placemats and the cutlery and everything. Uh, tables for 10. We're now still six, but it won't be long. The picture on the right is the main living room with a great big fan and the fireplace as it is today with the doors, which we can open every now and then, but they're also good for heat. And uh, we have a heat exchanger, the old Encyclopedia Britannica on the left there and the same kind of lamps and couches we always had. And that same copper pot, thanks to you. Yeah, there it is, good catch. There it is. And a lovely felt artwork done by a guest. So we do have a variety of places you can stay when you come here, depending on your taste and budget. So starting at the low end, in the center bottom are the field cabins, which we call the tool sheds, and they're very modest. Uh, upper right of those are the beach barracks and beach cabins, which are on the modest side. Above center is the boathouse, which doesn't have plumbing either. And after that, it starts to get fancy. Bottom right is Victoria, shared washrooms down the hall. Uh, common living room, good for groups and families. 
The one above that on the top right is Three Oaks. It has a common living room. Each bedroom has its own private bathroom and what have you. Uh, and then on the left, upper left is Eve's. Then we get into the number of cabins we have that are completely private. That one has several living room bedroom, has a private bathroom, has a tub, has a great afternoon view. And no matter where you stay, in fact, the bottom left is the view from Eve's cabin. But no matter where you stay, none of our places have kitchens because when you hear the bell, you come in and sit down with your friends and your other guests and you get good home cooking from our staff of local people who buy everything they can from the local farmers and, and uh, homemade bread every day and homemade soup every day and breakfast to order and all that stuff. And then you get into the fancy stuff here. These are the white beach and the cliff cabins on the bluff on the top left and the bottom left. The view of the beaches, one of the original beach cabins on the bottom right. Those are one of the original ones that came around in 1939 that you saw early on in the presentation. We've done a bit of upkeep to them since then, but they are the same place, the same place they were. And uh, yeah, hospitality, like I mentioned, dad's uh, family, big on hospitality, he received no hospitality as a prisoner of war. So he always made sure I understood the difference between in the, in the business we're in, the difference between accommodation and hospitality. You can have someone come and stay and they can pay for a room and sleep and get up and go, or you can make them feel welcome and you can feed them properly and you can give them a little more than they expect. And you can be just a little friendlier and a little more generous. And then they will feel like they're really being looked after and then probably want to come back. So the picture on the top left is us having fun in the dining room. Now that's an old picture, not just because of how crowded it is, but because the tables are still rectangular and we still have those cheap old plywood chairs. So nowadays we have lots of round tables so you can see who you're talking to and better chairs, uh, but we still have lots of fun. I think we're probably singing happy birthday to somebody Bottom right, there's my bass and the piano where we're gonna play jazz on Saturday, dining room in the background. And the lower left is one of the impromptu times in the summer where people have a bonfire uh, on the big concrete patio surrounded by, you know, right next to the pool, never during fire bands, of course. So while we're still allowed to have bonfires, there's probably some people playing music, having a little sing-along. You can see the lights of the lodge in the background. And uh, yeah, we have, guests that come back year after year after year. We're happy to see all the time. There may be a couple on tonight listening in. And if you are, then uh, just so you know how much we value your, your patronage and look forward to seeing you guys. There's the cutter running in the uh, modern era, roughly speaking. I'm uh, at the very back at the helm, the old Canadian flag, which we'll probably review these days, uh, not so many people on board. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a maximum of 12 allowed by Transport Canada. But as you can see, she's in great shape, running nice and smoothly, all painted up and shined up and looking pretty and beautiful old boat. And uh, yeah, there's uh, we have synchronized deer. <laughs> That's just a lucky shot. But no, the, the main. The big attraction of the lodge is the property. It's 185 acres of uh, beautiful waterfront for this area. A lot of old growth, uh, the vast majority of it undeveloped. And in fact, uh, many years ago, I took a big, almost a 70 acre parcel and locked it down into a conservation covenant. So it can't be logged or subdivided, have anything taken away or dumped on it. It's registered on the title and that's in perpetuity. So. Whoever takes over after me can do whatever they want with the 30 acres where the lodge and cabins are, but they're gonna to have to deal with it. Uh, they're gonna to have to operate the lodge with 70 acres of natural forest around them because that's what it's, that's what it's all about. These are some views. Those are people sitting in chairs, probably before the lightning started, but uh, just, you know, any time of the day or whatever, you can usually find a, a nice spot and a nice view around here because let's face it, it's a gorgeous part of the world. It's a nice piece of property. And uh, hopefully that's one of the reasons people come here. There we go, taken directly from our brochure. Kind of sums up what we're about, you know, 
hang out. We'll do all the cooking. We'll do all the cleaning. You can hang with your friends and relax and put your feet up and do as much or as little as you want. It'll be coming up to 80 years soon. So does this signal the start of question period?